Tonight we're going to be talking about what is creation science, and I think that needs to be done because it has been grossly misrepresented. I think one of the best places to start is with a statement by Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia as they were considering the issue in the Edwards versus Aguilliard case, the Balanced Treatment Act from Louisiana. This was an act that was ruled unconstitutional. Really, really bad things they wanted to do in Louisiana. They wanted to have balanced treatment on this issue. And they decided they didn't need that, and we'll talk more about it in a moment. But in the process, Rehnquist and Scalia says, we have no basis on the record to conclude that creation science need be anything other than a collection of scientific data supporting the theory that life abruptly appeared on the earth. And I agree with them. That's what we're talking about, the scientific evidence. Uh, as illustrated on the slide, we're talking about what we can see and touch and taste, the empirical evidence. Well, now, how is that going to tell us whether things were created or just naturally occurred? Can you distinguish between natural origins and uh, created intelligent design origins by looking at the physical? Well, let me illustrate. We look at this rock. Uh, tell me about the origin. Did this happen naturally or did someone design it? Well, you've got a pretty good idea. This probably happens naturally. On the other hand, we see this rock and uh, I don't think that happened naturally. <laughs> I think created design is the best explanation and I think most would agree. But now then we have entered into the area that has to be relegated to the Sunday school classroom. You can't have that in the schoolroom. Does that make sense to you? You can, by looking at the empirical evidence, see whether this happened naturally or whether it was designed and no, this is not necessarily religion at all. Another very obvious illustration I believe is seen when you walk down the beach and you see the lines, the lineations here that parallel the waves. Now, was this natural or was this designed? Well, you say that probably the waves did this, it parallels the waves, you can see them producing this kind of effect. Some order, yes, but probably still of natural origin. But you walk a little further and you see on the beach, John loves Mary. Well, you probably did that, you think. But if you conclude that it must be intelligent design, now then you've got to be in the Sunday school classroom. You can't be in the schoolroom. I think that's just utter nonsense. But demonstrates that from the empirical evidence you can see clear indications uh, to distinguish between the natural and the designed. And when we look at the universe around us, we see abundant evidence. I believe, of design, and that's going to be our theme actually throughout the week. But when we look, for example, at this bacterial flagellum, the little tail on the end of the bacteria that helps it propel, this, this is astounding. When Darwin looked at the, quote, simple cell, he saw what was called a black box. That's all he could tell. Well, as we learn more about it, it's like a city with factories and just mind-boggling complexity. This particular machine, and that's the only way to describe it, is an electrical motor. It has rotors, it has stators, it has O-rings, bushings and U-joints, it has drive shafts, 
uh, all of this is coordinated in 30 functioning coordinated parts such that if any one of the 30 parts is missing, it doesn't work. There's no way to get the first five and then work for a little while and then gradually get another one. If you're missing any of them, it stops. You've got to have all of them at once. And I don't think there's any way to explain that in terms of a gradual evolutionary process. And the design is absolutely astounding. It turns at up to 100,000 revolutions per minute and can reverse directions in a quarter turn. Uh, our engineers today can't build that. We don't have anything that our engineers can design that works that efficiently or that works that well. Now, if you see intelligent design in John Loves Mary, what do you see when you see an electric motor with better design than anything we've been able to come up with? I don't think that's a hard question. In fact, evolutionists understand that. Richard Dawkins is one of the more prolific writers uh, uh, against creation for evolution in our time. He's from Oxford. And he reminds people in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, right at the beginning on page one, that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed. That's the way he, studied, the way he defines biology. Now, he doesn't believe it was designed, but it, it's an illusion. <laughs> yeah, it looks that way, and he admits it, but it's not so. Francis Crick, Nobel laureate, co-discoverer, describer of DNA, makes a similar statement when he says biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, because obviously it looks that way, and you've got to really work at this, or you'll get the wrong idea, because... You, you have to constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed. And you've got to work at that. <laughs> uh, but rather evolve. He has faith, of course, in that. Well, I think maybe it's more reasonable to just believe that what it looks like is what it is. Uh, but I think it's their philosophy that drives them in the opposite direction in spite of how it looks. We need to understand that as we're talking about origins, there are two possibilities, and only two, and that's, that's important for several reasons. Notice the statement by Douglas Fatuma, again, a very prolific writer against creation, but a, a well-known scientist. He says, creation and evolution between them exhaust the possible explanations for the origin of living things. Organisms either appeared on Earth fully developed, or they did not. If they did not, they must have developed from pre-existing species, from some process of modifications, naturally or suddenly uh, not natural. And, and there are variations of each. But if we understand there are only two, now sometimes we get the objection, well, you're only talking against evolution and no evidence for creation. And we're going to be dealing a lot with the evidence for evolution and showing that it's not valid this evening, but if you'll be here for the rest of the week, you'll see that charge is absolutely false. But if there's only A or B, and you show it's not A, you have given positive argument for the other, haven't you? But we're only allowed to have one of these views in the classroom. You can only teach evolution, because after all, that's science, and creation is religion, and never the twain shall meet. I think that's a naive to the point of being absurd. Both evolution and creation can be investigated scientifically, and I believe we demonstrated that very simply and very easily, and it'll be more obvious as we proceed. And both evolution and creation have profound religious implications. You mean evolution has religious implications? Well, if you're not aware of that, you hadn't thought about it very much. Let's look at some of the statements by some of the leading evolutionists in the country, beginning with Edward Erickson, writing in The Humanist just a few years ago. He said, the core of the humanistic philosophy is naturalism, and this naturalism is his religion. That's the proposition that the natural world proceeds according to its own dynamics without divine or supernatural control or guidance, and that we humans, beings, are created uh, creations of that process. 
obvious religious implications. Richard Lewontin uh, makes the point even stronger. Uh, again, one of the leading evolutionists in the country from Harvard. He says it's not the methods and institutions of science that somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. Now, a lot of people think well, scientists wouldn't look at it that way. No, it's not science that says you have to look at it naturally. On the contrary, he says, we're forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation, a set of concepts that produce material explanations. We have made up our mind, we're going to see it naturally. We adhere to that materialistic philosophy and we're going to set up all of the investigation so that it produces that answer no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying. In other words, it may look crazy, but that's the way we're going to do it. Moreover, that materialism is absolute for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Now, this is the, the philosophy that dominates in science. And to say there's no religion here is just extremely naive. Notice the statement by Steven uh, Pinker of MIT. He said, no evidence would be sufficient to create a change in mind. That it is not a commitment to the evidence. <laughs> Can you believe this? this? This is a scientist speaking. We're not committed to evidence in, in terms of this issue of materialism as opposed to the divine. But it is a commitment to naturalism. That's the thing that controls. And nothing's going to change our mind. They've made up their mind and that's where they are because there are no alternatives, that is, except God and they're not going there. We would almost have to accept natural selection as the explanation of life on the planet even if there were no evidence for it. Because then you're faced with God <laughs> and they're not going to do it. They have committed themselves to naturalism. And so to say one is pure science and the other is religion <laughs> is very naive and just not so. Isaac Isimov, perhaps the most prolific writer, written over 600 books, uh, recently deceased, an atheist, nevertheless says, I have faith and believe myself. I believe nothing beyond these, those natural laws is needed. That's his faith. I have no evidence for this. It is simply what I have faith in and what I believe. So it's a blind faith. He has decided to be, in his religion, a naturalist. And he's committed to that. He believes that because he wants to believe that, not because of the evidence. And it's not because of science. It's because of a commitment to a religious philosophy. In fact, when you look at the philosophy of the unbeliever, they have to believe just all kinds of nonsense to be an unbeliever. Unbelievers are, are great believers. <laughs> they have to believe that an explosion produced all of the order that we see in this universe. That, that takes a lot of faith. They believe that uh, molecules somehow came into existence on their own and then bounce around for tens of billions of years and become living cells all by themselves. And they believe that. They believe that errors in the complex genetic system of that cell can produce greater complexity. I've not seen such faith in all Israel. Uh, it's just unbelievable what an unbeliever has to believe to be an unbeliever. But they say, we're going to be scientists and you're religious and you have one in the classroom and you can't have the other and it's... <laughs> Interestingly, late last year, uh, a court decision rendered the conclusion that atheism is religion. And some folks up at the Wisconsin State Penitentiary got in trouble because they didn't honor the religion of one of their cellmates there, one of the, the people there in, uh, in one of the inmates. Federal Court of Appeals ruled yesterday atheism is religion. And so people say that's not so well. You've got court decisions uh, on the matter. Michael Roos is one of the leading philosophers in the country. I attended a debate where he was defending his position last week in Los Angeles. Uh, 
And he acknowledges evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. He says evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with its meaning and morality. Evolution is religion. So the leading philosopher of science in the country says this is religious. It's the alternative. And they're committed to it devoutly. But that's the religion that is established in our country. Now, our Constitution says you can't have a state religion established by the state supported by the state but we do and it is the religion of naturalism that is defined by the courts as a religion that is promoted in our schools to the exclusion of all else all other religions as propaganda and our tax dollars supported by the billions one very obvious example, the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History, according to the Chicago Tribune just last year, said the whole, core, and this is from the president, the core of the museum is evolution. And of course our tax dollars are supporting it. Recent years it has dedicated a lot of resources to educate visitors about evolution. That includes spending $17 million in two years to recast its permanent exhibit on evolution. And we're paying for that. That's the establishment of religion in our country. Our schools pontificate humanistic naturalism without allowing any alternative or allowing anyone to point out the weaknesses, typically. For an example, uh, Prentice Hall's biology textbook puts it this way, and this is a standard high school biology text. There's no doubt that if you jump up in the air, you'll end up on the ground makes no difference whether you understand or even believe in gravity. Just as definitely life on earth evolved and is continuing to evolve all around us all the time. Supported by our tax dollars. Just uh, pontificating. This is the way it is. Yes, it is definitely religious and we have the establishment of religion. But some would say, I understand the problem. But isn't it illegal to do anything else? And the answer is absolutely no, though the press would leave that impression, and they do regularly. And I can say that because I have Supreme Court authority to say that, again referring to the Edwards versus Aguilliard case, this time the majority, written by Brennan, tells us this, the act, this, this terribly unjust act that says you ought to have balanced treatment of these issues. This act does not grant teachers a flexibility they did not already possess. In other words, you don't need this act. You already have this flexibility to supplant the present science curriculum with the presentation of theories besides evolution about the origin of life. You already have that right, he says. Teaching a variety of scientific theories about origins, and as we've documented, there's only two, but you can do that. It might be validly done with the clear secular intent of enhancing the effectiveness of science education. Now, you can't do it to promote belief in the Bible or a particular religion. But as science, you can validly teach a variety of origins as we looked at the arrowhead as opposed to the natural rock. We, we look at varieties of explanations of origins. And yes, it is legal. In fact, when this act was overturned, many in the press said, well, they've outlawed creation science. They said that. <laughs> they were lying, but they said it. Stephen Gould was interviewed about that time and asked this question. He's one of the more famous evolutionists of our time. And he said, no statute exists in any state to bar instruction in creation science. It could be taught before, it could be taught now, which is certainly the case. And most of the people in our country believe that we should look at all the scientific evidence, all the scientific alternatives. In Texas, just a few years ago, Zogby took a poll testing this concept. Under the proposition, teach only Darwin's theory of evolution, 16% agreed. And I don't believe it's that different across the country. 
regarding the proposition also, I mean, teach Darwin's theory, also teach the scientific evidence against it, 75% agree. But the 16% dominate, and you can't do it in the classroom, or at least they don't do it. It's not in the textbooks. Uh, a more recent poll here by CBS Broadcasting was reported with the headlines, Creationism Trumps Evolution. Now, to be fair, it should be Creationism Trumps Evolutionism. They kind of prejudiced it with their wording. But testing the idea, or at least here leading the thought, Americans do not believe that humans evolved. The proposition was God created humans in present form. All Americans, 55% agreed. Humans evolved. God did not guide the process. 13% agreed. But the 13% prevail. And that's all that's taught in the classroom. In spite of this propaganda in the classroom, a great deal of progress is being made and a number of prominent scientists with <laughs> tremendous opposition and with great danger to their careers have taken a courageous stand. And this was in 2001 in New Republic with the headlines, 100 scientists take a courageous stand. And these were scientists in major scientific institutions across the country like the Smithsonian, the American Museum of Natural History, some of the leading universities. And they say, we dissent from Darwinism. We don't believe Darwinism can explain what we see in this world. And a hundred of them signed the proposition and put their name and their position there. And since then, the momentum has grown. And now over 700 have signed that proposition, all with doctorates in the natural sciences, including scientists from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, from the Russian, Polish, and Czech National Academies, from uh, universities such as Yale and uh, Princeton and Harvard and Stanford and MIT and Columbia and Purdue and Berkeley and UCLA and Duke and Cambridge and Oxford. Professors at these major institutions have said, we don't agree that Darwinism explains origins. And if you're wondering about Texas institutions, yes, uh, 25 from A&M, 16 from University of Texas, five from Texas Tech are signatories to this particular proposition. And from my experience in speaking on those campuses, there are a whole lot more that believe that. They come up to me after I speak and say, I agree with you, Dr. Patton, I just, I can't let it be known, but keep up the good work. These are brave men, and I could tell all kinds of stories that would just <laughs> give you shivers about some of the things they endured because of the stand. But in spite of this, leading scientists taking a stand against Darwinism, we have men like Ernst Mayer saying, no educated person any longer questions the validity of the so-called theory of evolution, which we know to be a simple fact. And we know him to be a simple liar. <laughs> he knows better. I know he knows better. <laughs> but he says this anyway, in spite of the fact that there are many educated people, as we've demonstrated. Carl Sagan certainly knew better and acknowledged in his book, The Demon Haunted World, only 9% of Americans accept that human beings, other species, have slowly evolved by natural processes. 13 to 9% is what the polls reflect, depending on who asked and how it's asked. But that's what dominates in the classroom. And I think that's a crying shame. And why, does it, why is it that way? I get asked that all the time. And there's a simple answer to that. It's because you and I have allowed it to happen. And we need to think about that. We are making progress in spite of uh, the great disadvantages that we have in the classroom. Debates across the country have been held, and uh, while they have slowed down and virtually stopped, uh, we are uh, <laughs> enjoying, well, the evolutionists have given up because they're losing, and they've quit. 
Uh, I had a debate scheduled uh, several months ago at LSU with the head of the geology department. It had been scheduled for about six months. Uh, I showed up, as did uh, enough students to fill the auditorium, over 400 students, but the professor didn't show. And so I won. <laughs> we spoke for about an hour, had another hour of Q&A. Some of them stayed till midnight. Uh, the organization that put it on did a survey when they first came in the door, gave out cards, and then collected them. 54% believed in creation when they arrived. That's, that means, I think, creationists have a disproportionate number that want to know about the evidence and are interested in the facts. They did a follow-up two weeks later, and 91% of those <laughs> then believed in creation. Uh, it didn't help him not show up. Niles Eldridge talks about these debates, and he has debated a number of times. I debated him in Orlando, Florida. He is curator of the American Museum of Natural History, professor uh, at Columbia. And he says, creationists today, at least the majority of their spokesmen, are highly educated, intelligent people. Skilled debaters, they have always done their homework, and they nearly always seem better informed than their opponents who are reduced too often to a bewildered state of incoherence. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the way it is. He says creationists travel all over the United States visiting college campuses, staging debates with biologists and geologists and anthropologists. The creationists nearly always win. And he's right. <laughs> uh, he was a pushover. He had so much in print that he, he was just in serious trouble when he started. When the press interviews evolutionists, they always have to interview Eugenia Scott, who is uh, president of the National Center for Science Education. Sounds like a very uh, prestigious organization. It's just a, it's a watchdog group that hates the creationists. It's one she formed by herself. And she says... Scientists should refuse formal debates because they do more harm than good, and they're, they're doing that now. That's, that's the standard procedure. And they do do more harm than good for the evolutionist. I was recently up in New York. Some of you know Keith Sharp, and we were lecturing there near Syracuse University, and he was trying to get a debate going, and he challenged 100 geologists within a 100-mile area, in my name, <laughs> to debate. And they all refused. And so with his advertisements on the back, he put, here are the geologists who refused to debate Dr. Patton. <laughs> and it's not just me. I mean, they have refused to debate creationists around the world. However, she goes on to say, but scientists still need to counter the creation. In other words, let's talk about this, but make sure you do it when they're not there. Now, is that good science? I think it's just nonsense, and I think we ought to ridicule it and make fun of it. <laughs> it's certainly very different from Darwin's view, who had a much more reasonable perspective. In Origin of the Species, he says a fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. Does that make sense? That's what I believe. Of course, when you do that, <laughs> The creationists nearly always win, as even the evolutionists acknowledge. And so they've stopped. We're concentrating this evening on what is creation science. We talked in general uh, about what it is and some of the controversies and the misrepresentations um, and why we're having difficulty in the classroom in the first session. But in order to clearly understand what we're talking about with creation science, we have to define our terms, and this is seldom done and results in a great deal of misunderstanding. And I'll allow the evolutionist to define terms, and I'd like to emphasize a distinction that's made by G.A. Kirkut in his book, Implications of Evolution. He was chosen to write this 
book uh, one of a series of international monographs on evolution. And he says there's a theory which states that many living animals can be observed over the course of time to undergo changes so that new species are formed. And in the context here, he's talking about variation, what I'd call horizontal variation. A uh, cow gets a longer horn, longer horns or shorter horns, uh, maybe becomes spotted or not, but still a cow. Uh, and sometimes those variations are called new species. That's a very nebulous term. If I'm resistant to penicillin and Ricky is not resistant to penicillin, we're not different species. <laughs> But if bacteria becomes resistant to penicillin, or is, we'll talk more about that in a moment, and another one is not, they're not, I mean, they're different species, and it's just a very arbitrary term. But yes, there are things, changes, variations that we can see that are called new species. This can be called the special theory of evolution and can be demonstrated in certain cases by experiments. I would agree with that. And, illustrate it with uh, the variation that we see in dogs that can be bred within a few tens of years from a single source, all interbreed, uh, not different species, but variation within the kind, as we would put it. That's what he calls the special theory. But he makes a distinction here between that and another concept. On the other hand, he says, there is a theory that all the living forms in the world have arisen from a single source. Now that is a different idea. And which itself came from an inorganic form. This can be called the general theory of evolution. This is the issue, not the, the special theory, which we can see and is not really an issue. But the idea that all came from a single source and it from an inorganic form, illustrated here in this tree of life in the typical textbook. This is the general theory, and that's the issue. And if we don't distinguish those concepts, we get a lot of misunderstanding. What we're talking about then, in terms of what we disagree with, is a change from one kind to another kind, not variation within the kind. We have all kinds of communication problems when we don't make that distinction. One fellow says, I see evolution in the lab every day, and the other fellow says, evolution's not observable. And they're both right, <laughs> but they're talking about different things. One says, I see these changes, a little extra bump that uh, bacteria gets, and then changes back under certain circumstances. The other one is talking about the change from uh, the ape to man. Well, that's, that's not observable. You can't repeat that in the classroom. One speaking of special evolution, one speaking of general evolution, and many times in argumentation you see the change in definition from the beginning of the argument to the end, which leads to any kind of conclusion you want. Uh, I've been in the classroom where a professor would say, well, Mr. Patton, evolution has just changed. Don't you believe in change? And I say, sure, I believe in change. I've got some in my pocket. But I think we need to define our terms if we're going to have a good conversation. Uh, I've sent kids to college, as many of you have, and we could uh, understand the, the person saying it's a real nuisance to have to pay all that money to send the kid to college. But then you look on the legal textbooks and the public nuisance is a crime. And you can send people to jail for it. And so, if you switch those definitions in the process, you can say it's a nuisance and it's a, a crime to send a kid to college. We see the fallacy of that. People begin to argue with these small variations and reach conclusions with regard to the general theory that says all came from a common source. And the fact that you see small variations doesn't prove all came from a, a single source or that they all came from an inorganic uh, source. But that kind of switching of terms underlies just a ridiculous conversation sometimes. I think that's what's the explanation for Richard Dawkins' statement. Uh, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Now, he's 
seeing some variations, and, and you can see that. Well, yes. Therefore, you have to believe all came from an inorganic source. Well, no, that's, that doesn't follow. Well, but I can see this variation, yes. But you see how the, the, the switch confuses. Uh, Stephen Gould made a very reasonable statement when he says, no myth deserves a more emphatic death than the idea that science is an inherently impartial and objective enterprise. That's a myth. Yet it continues to thrive among working scientists because it serves us so well. That's no more true with scientists than it is with preachers or any other group where you see ambition and uh, careers at stake and people wanting to feed their kids and they come up with conclusions that serve their purposes and that's true in every field and certainly in science. Maxwell Planet, who is a Nobel laureate, says a scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light. Now we're told that and we maybe think that, well, here's a fellow who knows, a Nobel laureate, no, that's not how you get people to change their minds, he says, but rather because opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. You've got to have some funerals to have progress in science. That's a rather negative statement and maybe overstated, but it's not completely untrue. How should science work? When we say things are proved scientifically, we've got to have some way to determine whether it is or isn't not just who hollers the loudest, or shouldn't be. When we're talking about absolute proof, scientific proof, we're talking about at least four criteria. First, that it is an observable phenomenon. If we can't observe it, then there's no way to prove it scientifically. It's got to be repeatable so that you see it and somebody else can see the same thing. It should be experimental so that you can perform tests to see if it's verified or falsified, and it must be at least potentially falsifiable. There must be some kind of a test so that if this happens, it's not so, and if you can't come up with a test like that, it's not testable or falsifiable. Well, how do these apply then to the, the creation-evolution controversy? Is evolution, in the general sense, not the special sense, in the general sense observable. Can we see this in the living world? And we've asked this question, and it's interesting to see the variation in answers. G. Leonard Stebbins of Harvard, one of the leading evolutionists in the country, says the reason the major steps of evolution, and he's talking here about the general theory, you see, have never been observed is that they require millions of years. And, of course, that's the concept, but still you don't observe them. It's historical, you see, and so he acknowledges that. Again, Jeffrey Schwartz, a professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh, a famous evolutionist, says, it was and still is the case that with the exception of Dobjonsky's claim about a new species of fruit fly, <laughs> one that got an extra bump and then lost it and back, but anyway, he says this fruit fly is the exception, but the formation of a new species by any mechanism has never been observed. Some would make the statement even stronger than that. We don't see it in the living world, but of course you look at the fossil record and you record what has happened over the millions of years. You should be able to see it. So maybe not in the living world because it takes too long, but what about the fossil record? Again, Stephen Gould, uh, one of the leading authorities writing in Natural History, says the extreme rarity of the transitional forms and how would you see evolution in the fossil record? Well, you see the transitional forms, the only way you could see it. The extreme rarity in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontologists. We view our data as so bad we never see the very process we profess to study. D.B. Kitts, University of Oklahoma, made a similar statement, maybe even stronger, when he says, despite the promise that paleontology, that's the study of fossils, provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties. You don't see it in the fossil record or in the living world. It's not observable. Well, what about uh, numbers two and three, repeatability, experimentation? Theodosius Dobjonsky of Columbia, perhaps the most representative authority in defining the present view of evolution, says these evolutionary happenings are unique, unrepeatable, 
and irreversible. And he's talking about things like the change from Australopithecus up to Homo sapien, the ape man to the modern man. You don't repeat that. It's irreversible. The applicability of the experimental method to the study of such unique historical processes is severely restricted before all else by the time intervals involved, which far exceed the lifetime of any human experimenter. And so it's not repeatable, and it's not subject to experimentation. Well, there goes one, two, and three. What about number four, falsifiability, the testability? Colin Patterson uh, was curator of the largest fossil museum in the world, British Museum of Natural History, and he makes similar statements. He says you, it is uh, talking about the general theory, unique and unrepeatable like the history of England. This part of the theory, in parentheses, that evolution has occurred, is therefore a historical theory about unique events, and un unique events are by definition not a part of science, for they are unrepeatable and not subject to test. But that's the essence of falsifiability. All four of these criteria are not met when you're looking at the general theory of evolution. It takes too long, you can't repeat it, you, it's not subject to experimentation, you, it's like a history, you can't uh, test it. And so why say this is scientifically proved? Well, either you don't know what scientific proof is, or you're not telling the truth. Now, maybe there's a third alternative. I'll be glad to listen, but it looks to me like if somebody just jumps up and down and says, I know this is proved scientifically, one of those two is so. Not telling the truth, or he doesn't know what proof is. Now, the same objections can be made about creation. You can't observe that. You can't repeat it. It's not subject to experimentation. It'd be very difficult to falsify. And actually, on the point of falsifiability, both creation and evolution have some falsifiability uh, connected with it. And we'll talk more about that. But generally, certainly when you're talking about uh, the major arguments for evolution, uh, like survival of the fittest. Okay, what, what is the fittest? Well, it's those that survive. You're talking about the survival of those that survive. How do you test that? It's, it's not testable. But generally speaking, neither creation or evolution are subject to absolute scientific proof. It doesn't meet the criteria of this empirical proof. However, both of them can be investigated scientifically, as we illustrated in the beginning of the presentation this evening, not reaching a conclusion that says proof, it is absolutely certain, proved scientifically, but reaching a probabilistic conclusion, this is more likely, this is uh, more scientific than the other. This is under the heading of model comparison. We look at the evidence uh, that we can see, and we propose models. Here's an idea, here's another idea. Which one fits the facts best? And that's the proper approach with these two models, neither of which can be observed directly. We don't see the ape evolve into the man. We don't see the man created. But we can see a lot of evidence that tells us a lot about the possibilities, and we can compare that evidence to see which model works best. This is sometimes called the principle of Occam's razor or the principle of parsimony. It simply says which view fits best, directly and simply. Now, you can make any model fit with enough secondary or tertiary or quaternary assumptions. You just, it, th this works except for this, but if you assume that, okay, it's, it, and, and then it fits except over here, and then you make this assumption. And the more assumptions you have to make, the poorer the model is. The one that fits directly and simply with the fewest secondary assumptions is the best model. And that is a scientific approach and the way we will proceed. Let's think about, from that perspective then, which model, creation or evolution, is served best when we look at what Darwin saw. Let's just back up and, and see what convinced him that evolution was the best explanation of origins. He sailed around the world as the ship's naturalist on the beetle. 
and he saw a lot of strange looking animals, especially in the Galapagos Islands, different from the ones that he had seen in England. And he talked a good deal about the finches, not initially, but later on he developed this idea. And he saw different finches on different islands, the islands without trees. Uh, there you see the finches with the big heavy beaks because they're making a living eating the seeds that they have to break with their beaks. But on the islands with trees, you have the finches with little pointy beaks that can reach in the bark and, and get the insects. And so they make a living better over here. And that was the argument. Look, it has evolved. Natural selection has selected this type here and selected this type here. Now, how did they originate? Were there the two types to start with, or did they develop? Well, you can't really tell from, the, but you do see a variety of finches. Beak shapes were different on different islands. Now, are we seeing proof that all came from a common origin and all came from inorganic form? No. At best, we're seeing evidence for special evolution. Now, what we've learned about it since Darwin was there is that all of these finches interbreed now, that's not in your textbook, but it is in the technical journals. They're one species according to that definition of species. This is really not a, a great illustration of horizontal variation or of special evolution, but that's all that it is. He saw no evidence for general evolution, but this is not the way it's presented. Let me give you an example of the way this kind of evidence is presented, and here this uh, made the headline just last year. Darwin's finches evolved before scientists' eyes. Now, Darwin saw the variations, but now then, here are people who are studying it in great detail, and they see what happened to these finches when there was a drought in the area for two years. And then, of course, it changed when the drought was over. But they saw the finches evolve right before your eyes. Uh, for the first time, scientists have observed in real time evolutionary changes in one species driven by competition for resources. This uh, drought caused this competition and they saw evolution. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? What actually happened? Well, this shrinkage of the beak that they observed during the drought first was less than one millimeter. That's not a whole lot. You've got to look real close. And this shrunken size was not something that developed that wasn't there before. It's not new. There were, it was there before. There are just more of them now. Only the relative numbers changed. There was the <laughs> big and small, one millimeter difference, before and after. But during the drought, they could see that there were a few more with the smaller size. And then after the drought, it went right back. So nothing accumulated. But how do they report it? Finches evolved before scientists' eyes. I, they ought to be ashamed. I mean, that's just disgusting when all they're seeing is a change in relative numbers, and you have to wonder even about that when you see the small amount that they're talking about. And why do they, <laughs> why do they present this kind of evidence? Because they don't have any better. Like the, the old argument, why does the stork stand on one leg? If he lifted it up, he'd fall down. If you don't have another one, that, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> but this is the best they can do. And this is the kind of argument that's touted as proof. And, when you, and then you look and see what all the facts are. It's just nonsense. Variation less than a millimeter in the numbers, not in the size. The size changes were there all along. Different finches, <laughs> like different cows. I think we should think about what Darwin did not observe. We see variation. That doesn't really surprise us. We see it in a litter of cats. We see, we see it, I mean, we expect that. But when we think about what birds would look like if evolution were true, maybe we would see a cowbird uh, or a bird dog, <laughs> uh, an elephant bird. I, these are strange birds. Uh, <laughs> maybe a baboon bird. And wh why do we laugh at this? We know 
<laughs> this is nonsense, right? I mean, this, this, there's no question. This is crazy. Darwin didn't see anything like this, and he's not going to see anything like this. What he did see, we expect. It's not funny. But the kind of thing that would be evidence of evolution would just shock the daylights out of everybody. And, and what is seen is at best horizontal variation, and in this case, not a very good example of that, since they're all one species. We see it in the dogs to a greater extent than we see in the finches, and we know they interbreed, and they know, we know it's the same species. One of the arguments that was made in Darwin's time, or shortly after he wrote the book, was uh, regarded the pepper moths, and this is in every biology textbook in the country. Here's proof of evolution. Now, let's, here's, here's what Darwin saw. Let's compare the models and see which one fits best. This is the way it looked before the Industrial Revolution. The light-colored trees hadn't been stained by the soot, and the lighter-colored pepper moths were somewhat camouflaged. The dark ones stood out. And so we're told that the birds flying around had black ones for lunch more often than light ones, and so the numbers changed. But when the Industrial Revolution took place and stained the trees dark, then the dark ones were camouflaged and the light ones stuck out, and now then there's more light ones. Now, you've got light and dark before, and you've got light and dark after. Again, all the change that they're pointing to is a change in the relative numbers. But here is what's in the textbook as proof of evolution. And even that has been grossly misrepresented. But notice the statement by Matthews, who was honored as one of the greatest biologists in Europe, chosen to write the introduction to the centennial edition of Origin of the Species. He's an evolutionist and chosen by his peers to have this honor. And in that introduction, he said, the peppered moth, Bistian betulera, which is the species, Experiments beautifully demonstrate natural selection, which has since come to be questioned, as we'll see, but, or survival of the fittest in action. But they do not show evolution in progress, for however the population may alter, all the moths remain from beginning to end. Bistin, but it's the same species. Bistin bachelera is still Bistin bachelera. You've got light ones and dark ones before and after. <sighs> But you look in the textbooks, and boy, this is, this is the proof. In fact, in uh, International Wildlife Encyclopedia, we see the statement, this is the most striking evolutionary change ever witnessed by man. I think they're right. <laughs> I think that's, that's the, best, the best you got. But this is not general evolution by any means, not even close. And since then, it has been thoroughly discredited, uh, though not in the textbooks. In Nature, uh, one of the more respected, or perhaps the most respected scientific journal, back in 1998, this is not really new stuff. It's had plenty of time to get into the textbooks. Majerus notes that the most serious problem in that Biston Betulaire probably does not rest on tree trunks. Well, that's the only place I've ever seen them <laughs> in the textbook. Exactly two moths have been seen in such a position in more than 40 years of intensive research. The natural resting spots are, in fact, a mystery. This alone invalidates Kidwell's release recapture experiments as the moths were released by placing them directly onto the tree trunks where they are highly visible to bird predators. And by placing, he means glued. <laughs> so you could take the picture which he goes on to, to note. Finally, the results of Kidwell's behavioral experiments were not replicated, which you're supposed to do to have good science. In later studies, have no, the moths have no tendency to choose math, matching backgrounds, which is what's told in the, in the textbook. This illustrates, at best, horizontal variation, and is not a real good illustration of that. It's been doctored and glued and <laughs> misrepresented. Why do they present this in the textbooks? <laughs> Just remember, that's the best they've got. That's why. We do have an additional argument that's been added fairly recently. That's not what Darwin saw, but we'll treat it here because it's a similar type argument. 
It's the little bitty changes that he imagines will add up to the big ones. And we've all heard, well, you don't want to take too many antibiotics. This will evolve this resist resistant form. And here's proof of evolution. And that's in the textbooks now, alongside the pepper moths. Just recently, in the last week, Hillary Rodham Clinton was quoted in the New York Times saying, I believe in evolution. Uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria is evidence evolution is going on as we speak. And you know, she can see that in the textbook. Now, what, what are we uh, dealing with? Do we see evolving bacteria? They become resistant. Now, again, if I'm resistant, you're not. That doesn't mean we're different species or we've evolved, but it, with bacteria, it does. But that's not really what's going on, and it's really hindering what we need to be doing in science in, in helping us deal with the problem. We can see that demonstrated uh, very graphically in several instances. One more, most uh, obvious is in a expedition in 1845 where that went awry up in the Arctic. They were frozen. Frozen in Time is the book that describes it. Here reported in the Medical Tribune back in 88. Again, not new evidence. It may be time to rethink our thoughts about the mechanisms for antibiotic resistance patterns. Bacteria from the bowels of three members of an 1845 Arctic expedition have survived 140 years. Now, the bacteria is still there, 140 years. But now, no antibiotics back then, but we've got the bacteria. And they are showing resistance patterns to modern antibiotics. It wasn't exposure to antibiotics that produced this. They were there already. Current theories suggest that antibiotic resistance is linked to long-term exposure to antibiotics. Needless to say, antibiotics were not developed until long after these 19th century bacteria and their hosts were buried in the Arctic permafrost. It's not exposure to antibiotics that causes this. They're there already. They're the, the, the recessive form, but you kill off the normal form and what's left. They take over. And so you're actually losing information. Reported in Nature in 99, more recently, our results show that resistance to antibiotics is widespread, at least in some wild populations, the resistant forms, in wild populations, even though they have never, to our knowledge, been exposed to antibiotics. And so what we're looking at here is the normal bacteria that dominates, there are resistant forms, but they're uh, recessive, but then here comes the antibiotics, and it kills the normal form. They disappear, and then what happens? Well, the resistant form takes over. And what has evolved? Has the information content gone up or down? I mean, we've lost the major form. It's gone, and a small portion of the information now is taken over, if you approach it from the standpoint of information. But we've not evolved anything new. Now, this, this is a problem that we need to understand. Now, in, in both views, we need to be careful about how we use antibiotics, but if we don't understand what's going on, we're not going to be doing a very good job of dealing with it. And it's just propaganda for the textbooks in many instances. One way to evaluate models is to look at benefits. Here's a scientific theory. Has it produced any help, any benefit from it? And many people will say, well, our evolutionary concepts have caused science to go forward, and you can't have science without it. I'll notice the comments by Jerry Call, who is professor of evolutionary biology at the University of Chicago. And, it, I mean, it, this is a fellow, if there's benefits there, he should know about it. He's professor of evolutionary biology, a devout evolutionist. Truth be told, evolution hasn't yielded many practical or commercial benefits. Yes, bacteria evolve drug resistance. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I'm, I'm trying to find a benefit here, and it's this <laughs> antibiotic resistance, which is not true that he refers to as an example. But that's the best he can do. But hasn't evolution, he continues, helped guide animal plant breeding? Not very much. Most improvements in crop plants and animals occurred long before we knew anything about evolution and came about by people following the genetic principle of like begets like. <laughs> all this print breeding, we learned all we know about it basically from the creationists before we knew about evolution. 
Where is the benefit? Uh, he doesn't know of any. The one he points to is, is not a benefit at all. Crick, Nobel laureate, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, says it might be thought, therefore, that evolutionary arguments would play a large part in guiding biological research. This is far from the case. It's difficult enough to study what's happening now to figure out exactly what happened in evolution is even more difficult. So it, you know, what, it doesn't help us in our research. Where's the benefit? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the <laughs> lack of benefits, it's butchered generations of people as we cut out adenoids and we cut out tonsils and we cut out appendix because we're told this is an evolutionary vestigial organ not knowing that these did produce antibodies and helped us fight infection. In fact, there was a law in Wisconsin on the books for 40 years that any time the abdomen was open, you had to remove the appendix. Why? Because of this evolutionary propaganda. This is useless. And now we know better, and we just look back and we see butchered people that are having problems with allergies and all kinds of difficulties in overcoming infections. And a lot of it's because they've been butchered by evolutionary theory. Uh, I think there are benefits to creation, which has produced the plant breeding concepts, as he pointed out. Darwin observed, and let's summarize this way, small changes. And we can see some small changes, not as many as we're pointed to often. But these small changes, we're told, will, with great faith, add up to the big changes. We don't see it, but we believe it. And we exaggerate what we do see and often misrepresent it, but it's going to add up to the big one. Now, how do we know? Well, we have assumed that. It's not proved. It's simply assumed. Well, I think the assumption has been tested. Well, no, you can't test it because it takes millions of years. Well, not always. I think it has been tested and falsified by experiments with organisms that reproduce very, very rapidly so that you can observe literally, in some cases, billions of generations in a lifetime. The fruit fly reproduces every, can reproduce every 20 minutes. A new generation, you start multiplying every 20 minutes, <laughs> you get a lot of generations. Bacteria, sometimes every 20 minutes, a new generation. And so, well, the ape to man, you can calculate how many generations ought to have been involved there, and you have many, many, many more times generations that you can observe with bacteria and with the fruit flies than is even theorized between ape and man. And they haven't changed. They've done some terrible things, these little fruit flies. I wonder that... PETA hadn't gotten after the, all the, the, the scientific experiments where they <laughs> torture these poor little things with chemical, mutagenic chemicals and radiation, and, and they, they have the highest mutation rate of virtually any organism, and you can make them look pretty weird with big bulging eyes and different colored eyes and curly wings and straight wings and no wings, and, but they're still fruit flies. It doesn't accumulate or add up to anything. Michael DeSol, University of Lyons writing the Encyclopedia of Life Sciences, says, if mutation were a variation of value to the species, then the evolution of Drosophila should have proceeded with extreme rapidity, as it mutates more than anything, and reproduces <laughs> every two weeks. Yet the facts entirely contradict the validity of this theoretical deduction for we've seen the Drosophila type has been known since the beginning of the tertiary period, that is about 50 million years. And no, I don't buy the years, but let's play the game their way and see how it comes out. If this is true, they've got a very serious problem, or even just in the period of observation. It has not been modified in any way, they say, for 50 million years, and certainly not in the 100 years we've been watching them tortured <laughs> in the college classrooms. It ought to add up. We see the change, the, these uh, mutations, all, all kinds of them, but they don't. We can test it. Likewise with bacteria. Warner Braun, one of the leading experts, probably the leading expert in bacterial genetics in the U.S., uh, in his book, Bacterial Genetics, says the rapid rate of propagation, in other words, they reproduce every 20 minutes, 
the enormous size of attainable populations, changes within initially homogeneous bacterial populations apparently do not progress beyond certain boundaries. Yes, we see variation, but we see boundaries. You hear the textbooks talking about variations, you hear the textbook talking about boundaries? No way. It's there, it's just as obvious, and especially with bacteria. Uh, it was just really emphasized in this article from Science News just a few years ago as they compared fossil bacteria with live bacteria, virtually identical, except the fossil bacteria is a little bigger. <laughs> what intrigues William Schropp, paleobiologist, University of California, LA, most is a lack of change. One billion year old fossil blue green bacteria. <laughs> billion years, every 20 minutes, in a well close. They surprisingly looked exactly like modern species. Well, you see, you can't observe the changes because it takes millions of years. Well, you know, here's millions of years of something that reproduces up to every 20 minutes. And there's nothing. Not only like modern kinds, as we'd call it, which I think is broader, but exactly like modern species. When we look at the finches, when we look at the fruit flies and the bacteria, perhaps even more definitively, we see variation. What I would call horizontal variation. Not the kind of variation, by the way, that the evolutionist expects to see. All of them are harmful or neutral in the normal environment. They are few that are considered useful in limited environments. You, you press the biologist to give you an example of a beneficial mutation and he'll say, well, here's sickle cell anemia. You don't get malaria with it. Of course, you die <laughs> uh, if you have the two, uh, two people, mate, that have, uh, both have the form, it's going to produce death and we're spending millions of dollars to try to eradicate it and the, the hemoglobin in the blood doesn't absorb oxygen well and there's all kinds of problems with it but you, you have a little bit of resistance to bacteria I mean, I mean to malaria but that's a beneficial mutation all of them degrade complexity uh, some are cyclic the environment changes and then it changes back and it doesn't accumulate. None are unlimited in cumulative effect. They're, none are able to lead to new organs. Just a, a mistake in replication doesn't produce a new organ. And uh, they understand. So the variation is not the kind the evolution is looking for, but that's not all we see. In addition, we see boundaries to that variation. And we can give them just dozens of examples of, I mean, you see little horses that are bred up to big horses, but then you, they don't get continuing, you know, 20 feet tall. Uh, you can go down and you get to a certain level and then they don't get as small as rats. They hit a boundary and we can see that dramatically and quickly. This was reported and examined and uh, <laughs> acknowledged in a very important uh, meeting in Chicago several years ago, reported in science. A historic conference is the way the report began. And again, this is 1980. This, this is information that should be in the textbooks. The central question of the Chicago conference was whether or not the mechanisms underlying microevolution a little bitty changes, can be extrapolated or extended forward to explain the phenomenon of macroevolution, the big changes. Do the little ones add up to the big ones? That's the question. That's what's in every textbook, <laughs> biology textbook in the country. But here's the central question of the conference. The answer can be given as a clear no. And then they refer to Francisco Elia, major figure in propounding the modern synthesis. That's the, the modern theory of evolution synthesizing Darwinian uh, survival of the fittest with Mendelian genetics. The modern theory of evolution, he's the one that came up with it, or one of the major figures. Small changes do not accumulate. 
we can demonstrate that in the lab and in the fossil record. S.M. Stanley of Johns Hopkins makes a very reasonable conclusion from that. He's one of the leading authorities in this field. He says natural selection, of course that's what's supposed to work on these small changes that add up to the big ones and that's why they add up, but they don't add up. <laughs> and so what's natural selection got to do with it? He says this has long been viewed as the process guiding evolutionary change, but it cannot play a significant role in determining the overall course of evolution. Microevolution is decoupled from macroevolution. And if the little ones don't add up, what, what's natural selection got to do with it? Stephen Gould of Harvard says, I have been watching it slowly unravel, and he's talking about this theory that the little ones add up to the big ones, the mutations are selected by natural selection, I've been watching it slowly unravel as a universal description of evolution. I've been reluctant to admit it since beguiling is often forever, but that theory as a general proposition is effectively dead despite its persistence as textbook orthodoxy. It's still in the textbooks. That's, what's, that's how they explain evolution. The little changes, mutations add up to the big ones acted on by natural selection. That's dead according to the leading authorities. We know better, both from what we see in the laboratory and what we see in the fossil record. Now, there really, as we pointed out in the beginning, only two horses in this race. And one of them just dropped dead. <laughs> Who do you think is going to win? When we look at the two models, creation, evolution, we see the creation model, just from the standpoint of what we've just looked at, explains both variation and boundaries. We would predict the creator would put within each biotype the capacity to vary, to adapt to different circumstances. And these brown rabbits in Texas are not going to fare too well up in the Arctic, and they're, sometimes they're white ones, and they get to where they do pretty well up there. And so you've got white ones, and if you bring them down here, it's going to change. You see some variations that's going to help them, stay rabbits and succeed. And we would predict boundaries. We explain both. The evolution model explains half. And the variations that we do see are not the kind of variations they expect to see that would accumulate or give benefit or increase information. And the idea of them adding up <laughs> is dead because we, we know better. Can you tell which model works best? I mean, is that a hard question? This is the proper scientific approach. Let's compare what we see and see which model explains the facts best with the fewest secondary assumptions. Now, you can make all kinds of extra assumptions and make this look a little better over here on the evolution side. But it fits directly and simply and obviously best on the creation side. And therefore, I think that's the best scientific explanation of origins.